Hey church family, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe. Uh, man, it was so great to see you all once again this past Sunday as we gathered for one worship service at 1045. Uh, we'll do that once again this Sunday, uh, 1045. Again, I want to remind you to make sure you RSVP for that service, and we look forward to seeing you all there. Uh, and also want to encourage you to take advantage of our live stream. If you're not comfortable yet coming and gathering in person, uh, maybe you're out of town, for whatever reason you can't make it to the service, I want to encourage you to take advantage of that live stream service. You can find that on our website each each Sunday. I uh, also want to wish you a happy 4th of July this weekend. I hope you guys have a wonderful time uh, with your family. I hope it's a sweet time. And again, I hope you stay safe during this time. I uh, also want to let you know that this Thursday and Friday, our offices will be closed. Uh, but if you need anything, if anything comes up, you feel free to call, leave a message, and one of our pastors will get back to you. Uh, with that, we want to jump into our Bible study tonight. I'm excited to get into this topic. This is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I'm passionate about this topic. What we're going to be talking about is the mission of God. And I told you last week, if you tuned in last week, um, that what we see throughout the Bible is this idea of the mission of God. It's really throughout, throughout the whole Bible. You can't get away from it. In fact, I heard one author say, if you take out everything that has to do with missions out of the Bible, then all you're going to be left with are the covers. Um, this really is a mission story. And so I hope to show you that tonight as you're tuning in, watching this. And so I want to think about the mission of God really in four acts. Um, before we get that, I want to open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll jump into our time tonight. Father, we do thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you so much for your love for us. I do want to pray for all those who are listening now uh, that you would encourage them, that you would challenge them to live for you and to love you and to be transformed uh, more and more into your image. God, again, I thank you for this time. Bless this time. Uh, bless us as we study your word. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I don't know if uh, you've ever experienced this before, but maybe you walk in uh, in the middle of a movie uh, that maybe your spouse, your family are watching, or maybe it's the mid middle of a TV series, and, and it doesn't take long before you, you don't understand what's going on. Uh, you're watching, you're trying to figure this whole thing out, and, and you're just lost. Uh, you're hearing these details and these specifics, and they just really don't make sense in the context uh, because you don't know the context. You don't understand the context. You, you, you walked in in the middle of it. Uh, well, if we're not careful, sometimes we can approach the Bible that way. We can pull out verses. We can pull out stories in the Bible. And the challenge is if we don't understand its full context, if we don't understand this full story, the grand story of Scripture, uh, we don't necessarily, uh, we, we, we may misunderstand or even misapply uh, what, the, what, what we're reading or what we're studying um, you can think of it this way also. Uh, just last week I was doing a, a puzzle, a Lion King puzzle with my four-year-old daughter. And, uh, and I kept telling her, you got to look at the picture to be able to figure out where the individual pieces go. And so there you are, we're, we're looking at uh, a piece of the puzzle and all you see is, is a little bit of fur from, from Simba. And we're trying to figure out where this goes. And so we're looking back, referring back to the big picture to understand where that individual piece fits in. And so I believe it's the same way with the Word of God. It's so important that we understand the grand story, the big story of the Bible, uh, the grand story of God's mission to understand how these individual stories or, or, or individual passages really fit into that and even how our own lives fit into that story. And so again, I hope to uh, kind of walk through the Bible in really four parts, kind of think through it in four parts when it, as it relates to the mission of God. So we're going to see four things in the Bible as we study together. We're going to see God's mission revealed, and then we're going to see God's mission rejected, and then we're going to see God's mission restored, and then we're ultimately going to see God's mission realized. And so again, we're going to walk through the Bible uh, thinking through those four parts. And so we're going to jump in with God's mission uh, revealed. God's mission revealed. And it's revealed right at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. 
Uh, you see Genesis chapter 1 be begins with this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So if you just pause there, um, if you're just looking at the Bible for the very first time, immediately your thought ought to go to this whole book begins with God. And it's so important for us to understand that the, the Bible is ultimately about God. It centers on God, not on us, but on God. He is the main character, right? Not us. He, he's it. It centers upon Him and upon His glory and who He is. And so it's so important for us to understand right from the get-go. And then we, it finally gets to us. He does get around eventually to creating us. We are important. We are the pinnacle of His creation. But again, we're just not the main characters of this story God is. And so we get to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and it says this, Then God said, Let us make man, important phrase here, key phrase, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He goes on and say, and let, us, let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image, it's repeated here, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And then he says this important key, key passage here, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of heaven and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Here's the picture right from the beginning. I need you to get this. This is so crucial when it comes to defining God's mission, God's mission revealed. This whole book, this whole Bible is all about God and God uh, creates everything. We see this all over Scripture. God creates everything for His glory. When you think about the the span of the universe, how massive the universe is. It, it, it's not simply for our enjoyment. It's, it's for God's glory. It's to point to His majesty and His grandeur and how amazing He is. And so God creates it all for His glory, and, but He also creates us for His glory. He creates us as image bearers. The picture is that we, as image bearers, are to reflect God's glory back to Him. Right? So God creates everything for His glory. We, as the pinnacle of God's creation, are created to reflect God's glory, to be God's image bearers. And then notice the command. Right off the bat, He tells them, Be fruitful, all right? Have lots of babies, Adam and Eve, and multiply and fill the earth. In other words, here's the picture God establishes His mission right from the beginning fill the earth with worshipers. God's mission is the entire earth reflecting God's glory. Image bears all over the earth reflecting the glory of God because God is about His glory. That is God's mission. That is how He's revealed His mission right from the get-go. So this is so important as we think about the Bible and the full picture. You see this language all over the Bible that God is for His glory. He is for His own namesake. He's doing everything for His renown, uh, for, for His fame throughout the world. And so a couple of key passages here. Isaiah 48, 9 through 11 says this. L listen to this repeated over and over again. He's speaking to uh, Israel here. He says, For my namesake... I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tried you in the furnace of affliction. Listen to this again. For my own sake. For my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. He just clearly, boldly states it over and over again. God says, I am for my glory. I do all things for my glory. You take Psalm uh, 23, one of the most famous passages in all the Bible. We, we think about this passage often, and it is an encouraging passage and a comforting passage. But, the, but God's promises in this passage don't end with us. They're ultimately about God. Listen to this uh, in Psalm 23. He says, uh, God says this, or, or the psalmist says this, The Lord is my shepherd. 
I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Incredible, incredible promises uh, and, and things that God does for us in ways He blesses us. He says this, He leads me in paths of righteousness. But don't miss this key phrase in the middle of this passage. He says, for my name's sake. All these things He's doing, shepherding you, leading you beside still waters, right? Leading you into green pastures, restoring your soul. He's doing it all for His name's sake, for His glory. This is key to understanding the mission of God, that God is ultimately for His glory. The mission of God is not our happiness. The mission of God is not uh, that God loves you and has a great plan for you. The mission of God is to extend His glory throughout the nation, throughout the world. The world would reflect His glory. That's what we're created for. And that's where we find the greatest joy in, is living for Him. Not for ourselves, but living for Him. And so key to understanding the mission of God, God's mission revealed right from the beginning, is for His glory. All things are for His glory. So then we get to the next uh, chapter in this grand story, and it's the mission of God rejected. So we got the mission of God revealed, and next we get to the mission of God rejected. And we find this in Genesis chapter 3. This is, again, a familiar story. We know uh, Adam and Eve are told not to eat from the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then Satan comes along and tempts them, uh, deceives them into doubting God's goodness, into doubting uh, God's word, and ultimately uh, rejecting God's command. And so instead of living for God's glory, they focus on their own glory. And, and, and they begin to turn from God's ways. And so we know they give in to the temptation they eat of this tree. And it doesn't take long before things just spiral out of control. Uh, we get to Genesis chapter 4, uh, and we see Cain uh, killing Abel. Cain killing his brother Abel. And so again, we have this rejection of God's command, rejection of God's mission. Rather than be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth with image bearers reflecting the glory of God, instead we see man taking other man's life. Instead of life flourishing and, 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 and producing life and creating life, we see the taking of life. So again, it's a rejection of God's command. And then we get to, um, we get to Genesis chapter 5, uh, and we hear this language. It's incredible. Genesis chapter 5, verse 5, it says, "...the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart..." was only evil continually. And so man who was created to reflect God's glory now becomes a broken image bearer that doesn't reflect God's glory as he's called to, as, he's, as he was originally created to. And so we have this kind of marred picture of who we are. And so one way I like to think about it is just kind of using this cup as an illustration. So if you can imagine this being us and God creating us and and, uh, and this isn't a perfect illustration, but if you can picture this cup being able to reflect light, right? If it was, had, had more of a, a reflective component to it and it could reflect light, this is kind of what we're created to do is reflect God's light. But what happens is when we reject God's mission, when we reject uh, His kingdom for our own kingdom, reject His design, uh, sin enters into the world and it enters into all image bearers and begins to corrupt, corrupt us. It's like this black uh, plague that lives inside of us that begins to affect us and corrupt us inside and out. And, and we become this broken uh, image bearer. And so you can imagine this kind of all cracked up and broken like this. And so it no longer reflects the image of God as it was created, uh, as God created us uh, to do. And so over and over again we see this. And we even get to chapter 11 and notice again uh, this rejection of God's kingdom. God, uh, in Genesis chapter 5, He sends, He calls out Noah from this corrupt people. 
He, he brings a flood, basically wipes out creation and starts over with Noah. And Noah is given the exact same command in Genesis chapter 9 that Adam and Eve were given to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. He, he tells them again that I've created you in my image. So you're to fill the earth with worshipers, with image bearers of God. Fill the earth with my glory because that's my mission to, that the entire earth would reflect my glory. And so again, that's that's rejected quickly. We see it very clearly in Genesis chapter 11. Uh, Genesis chapter 11, again, key passage here, key chapter of Scripture here, um, where the Tower of Babel is built. So man comes together, and they unite together, and they work together, and they build this tower. Notice what it says in verse 4. Genesis chapter 11, verse 4 says, Come, let us build ourselves a city a tower with its top in heaven. And let us, key verse, let us make a name for ourself. At least we be dispersed over the face of the earth. So God calls them to fill the earth and reflect His glory. And instead, they come together, gather in one place, build a tower for their own glory, for their selves, for their own name. And so there, again, there's this clear rejection of God's mission uh, in place for uh, them wanting to reflect their own glory, wanting to live for their own glory. And so that's, we have so far the mission of God revealed. Uh, chapter 2, uh, as we think about this grand story, is the mission of God rejected. And then we get to chapter 12, and from here on out, we see the mission of God restored. Uh, the jump, the transition from Genesis Chapter 11 to Genesis chapter 12 is huge. Some commentators have said this transition from chapter 11 to chapter 12 is as big as the transition between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's some key things happening here as we think about the, the movement of God, this grand story of God. And so Genesis chapter 12 moves from uh, uh, kind of thinking about the world and what's going on in the world to God focusing in on this one family. And he calls out Abraham from this pagan country. Abraham was an idolater. He, was a, uh, he worshiped false gods. And God calls him out in his grace, in his mercy, calls him to himself. And he tells him, this is huge, in verse 2, he says, I will make you, this is God's uh, promise to Abraham, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. And I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. What an incredible, incredible passage, incredible promise. And we see God's mission restored through this family. God begins to focus his attention on this family and tells Abraham, listen, I'm going to make you a great nation. You're going to multiply. You're going to get huge, but it's not going to be ultimately about you. He tells them that I'm going to use you, your family, so that all the earth shall be blessed. The family of Abraham becomes the means of God's blessing. And so it's through Abraham's family that God would reach, bless all nations. So we see this over and over again throughout Scripture. God uh, the, the people of, of, of Israel end up in captivity in Egypt. And God rescues them from Egypt. And over and over again, you see when God brings the plagues upon Egypt that He's doing it for His namesake. When God rescues them through the Red Sea, we read in Psalms that He does this. He rescues them ultimately for His namesake. And then the fame of God goes out. And so that when we read in Joshua uh, chapter 2, when, when, when Israel reaches Jericho and they're about to come into the promised land, we hear about this prostitute named Rahab who's already heard about the name of God because the fame of God has went forth uh, from what God was doing through this family. And so God's fame was, was uh, God's renown, God's glory was being made known through what God was doing through the people of Israel. And so God would bless them and establish them as a nation. And ultimately they would go into exile. But even in exile, God was using and calling up people like Daniel to, to proclaim His glory to foreign nations. 
and was calling out missionaries like Jonah to make uh, God known to cities like Nineveh. Again, we see this missionary God throughout the Old Testament. That God was, yes, He was establishing His blessing and His covenant with Israel, but He was using Israel to make His known na name known among the nations. And so God is continuing to do His work. And then we get to the New Testament. And this is where uh, the culmination of, of God's mission uh, in terms of God's mission being restored, this is where the, where the culmination comes. And, and it really centers upon Jesus. He is the culmination of God restoring His mission. And so God sends His Son Jesus from heaven, the perfection of heaven, the glories of heaven, into this earth. He moves into our neighborhood like a missionary coming to a foreign land among pagan people, Right? And He makes the glory of God known. He reflects perfectly. He did what Adam did not do and what the rest of mankind has failed to do. He reflects perfectly the image of God and lived perfectly before God. And then He comes and He dies in the place of broken sinners, broken image bearers. And He, he cleanses them and He washes them and the Bible says He even fills them with His Spirit. And so He literally puts His Spirit inside of them. So not only are we image bearers of God, but the very Spirit of God living inside of us, shining outwardly. And He begins a work, a process in us to transform us, to make us new and cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that we would more and more reflect the image of God. This is what we're created to do. And we see this language all over the New Testament of who we now are in Christ and what Christ is doing in and through us to continue His mission to make His name known, to expand His glory throughout the earth. This is where the church comes in. This is what the part we play. Israel was the means of God's blessing. Jesus is the object of God's blessing. Now the church is the means of God's blessing. We are, are His ambassadors. We are the ones who are to take the light of the gospel, this treasure that is in us. We are to take it to the nations. We are to make Christ known among all people, His saving work among all people, so that we become a fulfillment to the promise of Abraham that, uh, that through uh, this people uh, all nations would be blessed. We now as the children of Abraham take the blessings of God, take Christ to the nations and make Him known. And so again, we, we, we fulfill God's mission. We restore God's mission uh, as His church uh, through two primary things, through two crucial things that make up the Christian life. One is that more and more we uh, reflect God's image uh, more clearly to the world. Right? So more and more uh, we are called to um, allow the Holy Spirit to shine through us and allow God's Word and God's Spirit to cleanse us from, un from our unrighteousness and our brokenness, to restore our brokenness, so we better reflect God's image. This is called sanctification. This is the process of becoming more and more like Christ. Listen to this, 2 Corinthians 3.18. It says, We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So as we behold the glory of Christ, as we look to Him, we are being transformed more and more, reflecting His glory better and better. And so we glorify God. We continue to fulfill God's mission as we become more and more like Christ, as we put sin to death and we put on righteousness. And more and more, uh, we, we are distinct from the world. We, we are not conformed to the world, but transformed, right? And, and reflect God's image more and more. We see passages uh, like Matthew. Matthew 5, 13 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its taste, how can it be salty? It's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. 
No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, listen to this, let your light shine before men so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We are called to allow our light to shine forth as we more and more reflect the image of God by putting sin to death and clothing ourselves in righteousness, walking in His ways, being obedient to Him, following Him day in and day out. So we glorify God through that, but we also glorify God by making His name known, right? We are called to make disciples. We're called to be discipled, become more and more like Christ, but we're also called to make disciples. The gospel is huge. Robbie Gallaty said it this way, the gospel came to you so that it could go to somebody else. It's not just to end with you. You receive the gospel. God made you new. He put His Spirit inside of you so you could glorify Him, but we continue the mission of God by making Christ known. Again, we see this all over the Bible. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, 8 through 18 through 20 says this, Then Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Key word there, by the way. We'll come back to that. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of of the age. We are called to make disciples. Again, notice what he says there. Uh, We make disciples uh, by teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. So we we are to go to the nations uh, proclaiming Christ and making disciples, teaching others what Christ has commanded so that they can better reflect the glory of God throughout the world. This is God's mission. This is what He's calling. This is what He's called us to. But notice this key word. He says, uh, therefore, go make disciples of all nations. This word, ethne, uh, it, is, it is this idea of not just um, countries. Like if you look at a map and you see these kind of different colors on the map representing different countries or different nations, don't just think that when you think nations. Uh, I think people groups. Think um, uh, different distinct languages and cultures that rep- are represented all over the earth. And so um, most missiologists de- uh, define a people group as, as this having this group having this distinct language and culture. And uh, they've identified around, depending on how you define a, uh, a people group, around 11,000 different people groups around the world. And so the mission of God is for us to reach all 11,000, over 11,000 people groups with the gospel so that they could receive the gospel and become, uh, they they would reflect God's glory uh, more and more so the whole earth would be filled with His glory. Um, This is such a huge part of the mission of God. Notice this, Matthew 24, 14 says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Again, same idea there. The gospel, the kingdom of God, preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And he says this, and then the end will come. And then the end will come. This this mission is culminated uh, or is fulfilled when all peoples around the earth hear of the good news of the gospel. And so that leads us to the last uh, chapter here, which is the mission of God realized. Um, the reality is this will happen. God's, we've already been promised in Revelation that God will fulfill His mission. The whole earth, every people group, all nations will respond to the gospel. There will be representation uh, from every nation in heaven. Listen to Revelation 7, uh, 9 says this, And after this I looked there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne in front of the Lamb. We see in Revelation that when Christ returns and He gathers His people, His church, uh, with Him, that there will be representation from all peoples, from all nations. God will receive the glory. God will be glorified by all peoples. So God's original mission, His original plan is realized. It is fulfilled in Revelation. We see it clearly. And so my question is, as we close this time out, 
is, um, is we live right now in the in-between, right? The God's mission has not yet been fully realized. It's not yet been fulfilled. God is uh, restoring this, and He's using His church. Once again, His church is the means to make God's name known and to reflect His image. And so the question is, um, how are we doing? And when we think about the 11,000 different people groups around the world, the reality is that most estimate there's still about 7,000 of those people groups that are considered unreached. So among 11,000 people groups around the world, over 7,000 of them are considered still unreached. What that means is they're still less than 2% evangelical Christian. There may be uh, some seeds being planted, some, some churches uh, beginning to work there, but there's really not a whole lot of Christian activity, not a whole lot of access to the gospel yet among these 7,000. And then among those 7,000, there's 3,000 of those people groups that are unengaged. In other words, uh, they don't even have access to the gospel at all. There's no mission strategy even taking place among these over 3,000 people groups. And so if you think about that, uh, if, if we're defining people groups accurately, um, which, which we may not be, let me just say that, we, we may not uh, define it clearly. It may not be 11,000. It may not be 7,000 or unreached. But here's the reality. If Jesus, ha Jesus hasn't returned, it means we still have a task at hand. We, we still have work to do. It means there's still uh, people groups who have yet to be reached with the gospel. We know that clearly. And so the, the question we all have to wrestle with is this is clearly God's mission. What part will I play in it? We, we have to come uh, to recognize that this is what God is all about. He's about His glory, and He's about His glory going to the nations. And so we as a church are the means to that. We are to make the gospel known among all nations. So the question is, what part will we play? What will we do to make an impact among the nation? How will we serve as His ambassador? Uh, how will we play a part to bringing people to represent, uh, that are representatives from every people group, uh, how will we play a part in bringing people around His throne? And so I want to challenge you, encourage you to be praying for the nations, praying for our church, praying for yourself as you think about how you can reach the nations. I will say this, one other point just to make. Uh, it's interesting that the nations in a lot of ways are now coming to us. So we think about this idea of sending missionaries and we need to be doing that. Uh, we think about this idea of giving money to Lottie Moon, and we need to be doing that. Uh, going on mission trips, all those things, we need to be doing that. But the, but the really amazing thing, too, is that in a lot of ways, the nations are coming to us. Atlanta is becoming more and more such a diverse place where we see um, ethnic groups all over Atlanta. Uh, just a couple of interesting statistics. There's over 9,000 Bhutanese people in the Atlanta area. Over 9,000 Bhutanese People, people who are uh, typically um, uh, Buddhists who would have uh, in, in their home country would not have access to the gospel. Uh, in, in Atlanta, there's, there's also a Hindu temple. It's 32,000 square foot Hindu temple. It's the largest of its kind outside of India. Uh, we have people all over our country. Um, in the past 10 years, or all over our, our city, in the past 10 years, uh, over 1 million people have immigrated to Atlanta from all over the world. Uh, just in Gwinnett County, there's 20% of the population, uh, enough, to, uh, enough people to fill almost three Georgia homes, uh, were born in another country. And so you think about that reality, that statistic, and so we have the, the nations in our backyard, and so our calling to reach Atlanta uh, is massive when you think about God's global mission. And we have an opportunity to, to reach people from, from other tribes, from other nations, from other tongues right here in our backyard. So again, I want you to be praying about and thinking about uh, how you can be a part of that, how you can serve to make God's name known among the nations, uh, even right here in Atlanta. So as we close out, let me pray for you. And uh, we'll continue to, uh, to pray for our church and, and pray for our safety during this time as well. Father, we do thank you so much for this incredible news of the gospel. We thank you so much that we get to play a part in this grand story uh, of what you are doing, Lord. What an incredible privilege it is 
uh, to be a part of making your name known among the nations. So help us to do that. Help us to be faithful to that day in and day out. Help us to pray for that and give sacrificially to that. Uh, even be willing to give of our lives to make your name known because we're reminded in Scripture it's not ultimately about us. It is about your glory. I do pray for the safety of our people during this time. Watch over them, protect them, help us to gather together, gather again this Sunday again so that we can worship and glorify your name because that's what it's all about, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.